let's kick things off. Calvin, thank you so awesome. much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I want to start specifically with your article, Why I Quit Working for Gary V, because okay. it's got uh, quite a lot of engagement on, on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And I think it's pretty interesting because there's this kind of thought out there that trading, exchanging value, um, if you're not actually, if you're being honest about the value that, that you want, they're seen as something wrong with it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you talked about in the article is that you quit working for Gary and there were a couple of very particular reasons mm -hmm. why you ended up working with Gary in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how that came to be? 100%. So um, I got my job for Gary now about a year and eight months ago, and then I was working for him for about a year and seven months. Um, but when I actually took the job working for him, it really kind of broke down. Uh, I wrote two main things in the article, but it, it was more than that. I just wanted to keep it a little simplistic there. Yeah. Um, it was more or less that I knew that I could learn a lot by being in the Vayner Media ecosystem or the Vayner X system as a whole. Um, you know, they're seen as being at the forefront of media and marketing and things of that sort. So I feel I felt like it was a really good place to expand my knowledge within marketing and then be able to leverage that elsewhere. And then outside of that, the other thing that I mentioned in the article was that um, working with Gary was going to give me an excellent brand, as is. Just saying, hey, I work for Gary Vaynerchuk, or now I worked for Gary Vaynerchuk, right. immediately kind of lights people's eyes up. It's probably why I'm here now, as you mentioned. You know, yeah. um, it's That in itself has opened a thousand doors that have you know, been super beneficial to me in my career, especially after having le left Vayner in terms of getting clients saying that, you know, I worked for Gary Vaynerchuk for a year and a half right. and I learned exactly what his team does from start to finish. I, there's literally nothing on team Gary that they do that I don't, that I haven't done as far as I can think of. Right. Um, I've created content. I've posted on behalf of Gary. I've, you know, I used to ghost write for Gary. I ran ads for Gary. It was such a mix of things that at this point, I just feel like I understand the system so well that when I pitch that to a client, they're like, oh, you know, he worked for one of the guys that is arguably one of the greatest personal brands, especially within business. Yeah. So I want that. And, you know, how can I get that? And then that's usually where like the sales pitch comes in, right? So, um, but more or less the two big things that I mentioned in the article, particularly where, um, you know, how do I boost my reputation in mm -hmm. this industry and how do I learn as much as possible? I think it's, it's crazy because one of the things he talks about is in the future, um, there's not going to be as much of a necessity or demand for college specifically as it relates mm -hmm. to kind of business type of mm -hmm. degrees. And he says in the future, people are going to pay him to intern for him. Um, and the, the salary that you made, I think it was like 15 bucks an hour or something yep. like that. It's funny because a lot of kids out of school, they might be like, Oh, $15 an hour. Like I could, I could deliver pizza and make more money. And mm -hmm. you're thinking about it in the wrong way. The way that you probably thought about it is it's an, it's a value exchange. I might as well work for free because that two years of experience, I can then leverage to, to whatever the hell I want. Um, and it's, it's smart. Uh, and it's funny that you could get some hate from it, but yeah, I thought, I thought it was, I thought it was a good decision for you to do that. And also to be transparent about the mm -hmm. amount of money you make, because yeah. a lot of people might see that again and be like, eh, I don't, I don't know if I want to do that. 100%. I, I think it's kind of funny. Money's a very taboo topic, right? Yeah. You, you'd never sit down at dinner with somebody and say, how much do you make? Right. Because that's just like an off limits question for the most part. Um, but outside of that, to kind of speak to what you're saying as an alternative to college, um, as a fun fact, I didn't go to college. Um, oh, really? I don't know if you know this. I'm 19. I'm very young. Yeah. Um, when I graduated high school shortly after uh, Gary tweeted on Twitter saying hey I really need somebody to help me on YouTube with growing and managing certain collaborations and things of that sort and at the time I had like five or six years of experience in the multi-channel network industry I got involved in it super young it was okay. basically talent management on YouTube and so I knew YouTube as a whole just how it operates how to grow channels things of that sort just from servicing other channels and, and you were doing this in high school high school and middle school. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was young. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I even, the funny thing is I started in that industry working for free, yeah. but it never occurred to me that way because at the time it was just something I was interested in. And so I hit up the CEO of a network called content pixel in the UK. His name is Karen Beji. I don't think he's doing content pixel anymore running the company. Um, and I said, Hey, I'm really interested in what you're doing. Is there any way that I can work with you or just learn from you? Whatever the case is. And but bear in mind, this is like a 13, 14 year old 
Skyping the CEO of this company. It wasn't a big company by any means. They were right. doing like 20K a month in revenue, but it was considerable, right? And um, he's like, yeah, sure, you know, why not? It's just extra hands. I was basically yeah. like the intern that you pass the shit work to type of thing. Um, and, you know, I learned the system. I w- worked for him for like a year and a half for free. But to me, I just thought I was learning. Did you, did he know how old you were? Yeah, he knew. He and knew. did you, were you concerned about that? Like as a 13 or 14 year old kid, are you thinking to yourself, am I going to be taken seriously? And do you I, still struggle? Do you still ha- have that challenge at all of like talking about how old you are? Mm-hmm. Because I mean, from the you know 20 minutes that we've spent chatting, you're obviously you're well spoken, right? Yeah. And, um, I appreciate it. Of course, but it's it's just funny to me because at the same time, um, there might be that little bit of uh, intimidation factor if 100%. you're going up against something older. Um, so at the time. It definitely was a thing. I hated taking calls with people that I thought were like potential channels to recruit to our network, right? Yeah. Because I had a squeaky voice. It was in the middle of puberty (laughs) type of thing where it was just like clearly something was weird there. Um, Luckily, a lot of the people that were these YouTube channel owners that we were trying to sign were also about the same age. You know, anywhere between like 13 at the youngest, surprisingly, with, you know, you'd find a 13 year old with a YouTube channel that has 200K and he makes gaming videos and it'd be like, okay, awesome. Right. Um, But then also you'd have like, you know, 19, 20 year olds, even like sometimes thirties um, with the same channels. And so when it got to those older demographics, that was always like a weird uh, place to be in uh, at that time, at least. But now particularly, I never really run into it. But the reason why is because in general, especially with client facing projects, I'll yeah. never mention my age. Uh, most people will never listen to me or look at me and say, oh, you're not in your twenties or, oh, you're particularly young. Right. Um, and most people will never ask me if I went to university or what university I went to. So for the most part, it'll never come up. Uh, every once in a while, there will be something that kind of like slips where if I'm discussing something with like in, you know, at VaynerMedia, there was an instance where I was discussing uh, gaming systems with a coworker and he mentioned uh, some Nintendo, like the Nintendo 64. It was just before my time. Right. And I was like, oh, that's old. I'd never gotten to play that. He's like, wait, how old are you? And so that, you know, <laughs> as soon as I was, at the time, I think I was 18. He's like, oh my gosh, you're a baby. And so it was, uh, that was kind of a funny conversation. He's a great guy though. So it didn't uh, get taken in any weird way. Um, but age absolutely pays the factor, right? You know, it, it, it's really funny because I feel like it's a huge contradiction. It's one of the biggest like ego boosts that I have is like I'm 19 and I and feel I'm like I'm killing this. it. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but then it's also just like I'm 19. I have to be super careful about how I present myself. Make sure that, you know, I don't uh, I don't act 19 in a sense. And right. to be fair, I, I don't feel like I'm acting unauthentically. This is who I am. Right. Um, but simultaneously, I don't necessarily want people to know that I'm 19 for the most part. Um, I'm becoming more and more comfortable with that because I'm realizing that I could to be honest, I could probably leverage it more than I do. Um, you know, being so? a young entrepreneur, okay. I, I feel like you are much more likely to get a spotlight on you if you're the 19 year old young entrepreneur works for Gary Vaynerchuk, sure. now running a agency instead of the oh another 25, 30 year old entrepreneur maybe worked for Gary Vaynerchuk but went to college. Whatever the case, right. it's just a slightly less traditional route, um, especially if you have some sort of success to back that. Yeah, you have to embrace your reality and your truth. 100%. And that's something that he talks about over and over and over again. And I think it's so true. I think it's kind of part of the reason why you probably have pivoted into starting this new agency with Mm -hmm. Iris. Mm -hmm. Um, Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, Iris Chen, who is my co-founder and business partner, she's the CEO of Iris Rosen Co. It is a modern day personal branding agency for entrepreneurs, executives, and influencers, as we say uh, say it. Um, Initially, it was going to be exclusive to female entrepreneurs, uh, executives, and influencers. What we've decided to do is pivot slightly because we didn't want to be too discriminatory in terms of the work and like accepting certain people. Right. So what we figured is that we would now take any client that is interested in the service. However, we're putting a big spotlight on women in business through the content that we're going to be producing and through the women that we're working with. Um, so Rabia Sutton is a good example. She's a client of ours. Um, we're going to be putting a lot of emphasis on creating content around her okay. as a company and then posting that via our social media outlets. And then we're also coming out with some monthly articles like Badass Woman of the Month, which That's is cool. going to highlight like young and upcoming women in their respective industries. And yeah, I say young, they don't even have to be young, right? It could right. be a 40 year old women that's doing something amazing in the medical field right um it really just depends 
but uh, that's something I'm actually super excited for because we're really aiming for like the Forbes 30 under 30 look, but highlighting just a single woman each month. Okay. Um, and I think it's going to really go over well. And I'm just super excited about like what the outcome will be, especially for the people that are involved in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it'll be a really good way to give the spotlight to people that don't necessarily already get that just because the way that I look at most uh, work environments is that, or most like societal systems per se, if we really want to go super philosophical, Let's is do that, it. I love, yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, I, I think that most systems are created to be very masculine. Um, when, you know, if you look at Greco Roman culture and literature, um, like the idea of public speech was mm-hmm. always a masculine trait, right? And that goes right. back way back to the Odyssey with Homer and his wife Penelope. Um, you know, when she goes and talks to the suitors to tell them to calm down or like to get out of the house, um, Odysseus's son, Telemachus, I want to say his name is. Okay. I can't quite remember. Um, throwing back to freshman year English. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, his son said, you need to go back to your bedroom, basically, because you can't speak in front of people. Like, that's a masculine trait. And then ever since then, you can just notice a very consistent pattern throughout literature and even in society today yeah. where it's kind of like the meme that will go around sometimes, right? Where it's just like, uh, you know, you'll see like five men at a conference table and then one woman, she brings sure. up an idea and then it's like, oh, that's a great idea, Karen, but let's let one of these guys handle it, you know? And then it's like, oh, okay. But that's very real. And a lot of people don't see it. It's, um, it's sad, but at the same time, I feel like that's a really big thing to address. I consider myself to be an empathetic person or, or, mm-hmm. or, or try to, I read a lot about emotional intelligence and obviously a lot of people might be seeing like two white men having a conversation about femininity <laughs> and like ha- have yeah. their own thoughts. Right. Um, but it's, it's interesting. It's, it's important specifically for our time. And I think one of the big things that you're probably focused on is the story is storytelling, mm-hmm. um, Absolutely. And telling that in a way that's contextual to the platforms, but also in a way that maybe has a universal appeal. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the the tricky part. But I'm sure that with a lot of the people that you work with, um, there's so much passion there and that probably helps you get up in the morning a little bit easier. Absolutely. That's something that I found even doing a podcast, talking to entrepreneurs, anybody that's kind of doing something unique, there's a certain fire, there's a certain burning there that is extremely attractive to listen mm-hmm. to, extremely uh, nice and, and yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, Iris has been an amazing business partner to work with. She's always super pumped about like whatever direction we're heading in and I kind of let her uh, spearhead the strategy per se, but obviously I uh, help kind of like consult on how we're going about it because All I right. take care of a lot of things very operationally okay. um, in terms of like building out the systems and the pipelines for, you know, how are we going to create content that best story tells around these women that we're going to highlight? How are sure. we going to best service these clients, whatever the case is? Um, and then she'll focus much more on like over, you know, the overarching strategy, like what is our mission? What is our goal? What is the big picture actually equate to? And then I'm doing a lot of the like micro steps. Tactical ex execution. Absolutely. Uh, one of the best pieces of content online today, I think is Gary's content pyramid, um, mm-hmm. that he, that he produces a slide share mm-hmm. ridiculous that that's free and that that's just available online. Um, I come, I come from an advertising background. I've done, done a lot of stuff in, in paid media, but what's interesting about the content pyramid and the type of stuff that, that you're doing is you have to really take a holistic approach. Mm-hmm. You have to understand how, um, posts on, on Snapchat and LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and, and Instagram and Pinterest all kind of combine cohesively to form, form that story. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you go about thinking about that? And how did your experience at Vayner inform you to kind of begin that process? So uh, as a fun fact, I actually created that deck, um, the okay. Gary V content model. <laughs> wow. Um, I didn't know. So to clarify, I created the deck in terms of the structure of it and what content was going to be put inside of it. And then we had some graphic designers help me out with like making it look aesthetic and all these things. So, um, but yeah, so I understand it very well. Um, and you know, (laughs) working at Vayner definitely shifted my perspective on content as a whole. Um, I came from the YouTube industry where YouTube was the main platform. You uploaded all of your content there and only there. And then you would use Twitter to talk to your fans. And then on occasion, you'd use Instagram to post a selfie. And that was really it. That was the way that every creator on the platform went about their strategy. So then getting to VaynerMedia, where all of a sudden it's like, hey, 
we're gonna upload this two hour keynote on YouTube and then we're gonna upload the best 10 minutes of it that has you know tactical business advice onto LinkedIn and then we're gonna upload the same two hour keynote onto Facebook but then we're gonna create you know 20 different pieces of one minute clips for right. Instagram and things of that sort and we're gonna upload those there and we're just gonna see which one over indexes and when we find out that when Gary talks about parenting, that everybody gets riled up and then that piece of micro content on Gary's Instagram gets a million views, we're now gonna take that same concept and topic and we're gonna turn it into an article in written word and then we'll also you know, take that same video but then get some more footage, attach it to it, make a three minute version for Facebook and then all of a sudden that takes off and then you know, there's a huge system and process that goes into it. But at the end of the day, if you keep it really, I'd say that it comes down to two things. How can you be as effective as possible with the content that you have in terms mm -hmm. of having a cross-platform uh, presence, right? It is much more beneficial to be on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and you know any other platform, LinkedIn, Medium, um, than it is to just be on YouTube or just be on Facebook or maybe only YouTube, Facebook, right? So having that cross-platform cross-platform presence was very new to me. So adapting to that was a little weird at first. Right. Um, and then outside of that, just understanding how they go about, okay, we found out that this clip over indexed, what can we do to build around that and then make more clips and content that's going to over index, but provide value to the end user and then collect feedback from the comments and see like, oh, they really liked, you know, that Gary talked about how in certain Asian cultures that parenting is much more strict, right? right. Or something of that sort. Um, it, it's always really interesting to actually understand what the audience thinks and then see how we can actually take that input and then build around it to put out even more content that, you know, gives them the value that they're looking for um <clears throat> it, it's it's fascinating stuff it's also interesting because a lot of this we talk about content creation mm -hmm. i think it's very important for personal brands businesses to have kpis in place mm -hmm. um and it's hard when you're creating content with like how do you attribute that to revenue how do you that how do you attribute that that to leads because and and is that piece of content, even if it got a lot of views, is it kind of creating the right message? Mm -hmm. As an example, when I did Gary's podcast, he uh, took one one minute clip out where I said I had just gotten out of a relationship mm -hmm. and that got 1.2 million views on Instagram, oh, okay. which is crazy. Uh, but 1.2 million views of people watching a one minute clip mm -hmm. is different than a thousand views of someone watching a 20 minute Facebook live 100%. Um, or doing a Q&A or something like that. So do you think about kind of like width first depth as well? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it's it's funny that you say that because I had a conversation very similar to this. Uh, it must have been yesterday um, where I had pointed out that one of my good friends, Brett Conti, who's an influencer here in New York City, he has, you know, maybe like 30,000 followers on Instagram, but he has like 90,000 on YouTube. And I said, I would take that setup any day in yeah. comparison to vice versa, because on a platform like YouTube, where you're consuming video content that is usually pretty long form because that, you know, follows best practices to be like 10 minutes plus. Um, you have so much depth in your audience. You know that that audience is probably so much hard, more hardcore about the content that you're putting out than the audience on Instagram is because they'll see a picture. They're like, oh, you know, maybe Brett's cute or yeah, maybe, you know, tap. the, the, picture in Thailand was just a really nice scene or whatever. And then all of a sudden they like the photo and they follow him and then that's really it. It's very surface level. So, you know, and then to speak to like a one minute clip versus, um, you know, a 20 minute video, but you know, you have 2 million views on one and maybe a thousand on the other. If, if it's that great of a disparity, right. I take the 2 million views, but sure. you know, if, if it were a bit closer where maybe you have a million on one, but then 500,000 on the other, I'd say 500,000 any day, just because even though it's two X, I'd even say three X, you know, if you went 250,000 on a YouTube video, but 750 on Instagram, again, the YouTube video any day, just because so many more people are going to remember who you are, going right. to remember that message and really sink in with your audience. And that'll probably convert much better in terms of getting a following or converting to certain business objectives. If you're trying to sell a course or a book or whatever the case is, then the 750,000 views on that Instagram video. Yeah, well, I mean, what what Gary's really created has just been kind of speaking to your truth. And I mean, even even starting the vlog, document over create, this, this ethos that 
we should just show who we are mm -hmm. and and let the rest speak and, and kind of let the world find us. Mm -hmm. I think it's such a beautiful thing. And there is a lot of, and, and it's challenging too, because especially today, I find myself challenged because on one hand, on one hand, we have Gary, who's speaking a very positive, uh, positive voice, continuing to talk about how much we have to post on social media. Mm -hmm. And then we have data on the fact that younger kids are coming up and there's more, there's increases of anxiety and depression mm -hmm. and loneliness mm -hmm. as a result of using social media. So that, that dichotomy is very interesting mm -hmm. to me. Um, as someone who's like, I've had, I've like been anxious in the past and I know that you wrote that article about mm -hmm. loneliness when you got to, to New York. It's interesting because we, we know that in order to be successful today, if we have a personal brand or a voice, we know we have to leverage these platforms, but we also have to be smart that we're not being overly attached to that outcome. Of course. It's, uh, you know, obviously you've seen that article that I wrote. Um, one of the most fascinating things that I found when I was researching that topic to actually put that article together is that 10,000 years ago, when in any given human was born, you were probably born into a group of, uh, of about 50 to 150 people. But the thing is that you stuck with that group for your entire life. Um, now people are born and then they kind of grow up with their family, but they're spending most of the time on their phone and whatnot. Um, the interesting part is that back then, 10,000 years ago, the reason why it was so beneficial to be a part of that group is because if you weren't in a group, it was so much less likely that you would survive, right? It was harder to you know, create shelter. It was harder to hunt. It was harder to fight off predators, anything of that sort. So it was actually just a survival tactic was right. to have a group that you would associate with. And so as a result, in order to, you know, in, in the same way that when you're very hungry, you can almost feel pain in your stomach as a result of our body telling ourselves, like, we need to be in a group to survive. You, we developed this like loneliness pain, this social pain that says, hey, you need to get back out and you need to socialize and, you know, find other people so that you can survive. And it's actually so bad that, you know, loneliness is worse for your body it's about two times worse for your body than being obese. And it's the equivalent of smoking a pack of cigarettes every day. Chronic loneliness, I should right, clarify. Right. But that's incredible, right? It's crazy. Um, and in the meantime, everybody's thinking, okay, well, you know, you know, you and I are in New York City. It has a metro population of about 20 million people. Right. How could anybody in New York City be lonely when there are so many people and we have so many ways to connect with people, right? You know, right. through the phone, Instagram, you can call somebody, whatever the case is, when in actuality, it's just that people get so buried in the newest season of Game of Thrones or the Instagram content that's on their feed from some model that lives in Miami that they've never even met before, right? right. And then in the meantime, they don't spend any time with the people around them. So then all of a sudden what you have is you have people that have like maybe two friends and of those two friends, they see them on a weekly basis if they're lucky. Yeah. And in turn, your body's just saying, hey, this isn't right. I'm used to being in a pack of 50 right. for my whole life. Um, because biologically, we're really not that much different from you know where we were 10,000 years ago. It's just not enough time on an evolutionary scale to really develop any other you know aspect to that loneliness or the social pain that we have. Right. Um, so I think, I think kind of a, an antidote to that can be finding a tribe. And sometimes we do that when we move into a new city mm -hmm. by just getting really involved with our company. Mm -hmm. But there has to be some sort of separation there as well. Mm -hmm. Again, it's depth over width, mm -hmm. right? Um, you can have a hundred acquaintances mm -hmm. or you can have a few close friends and I'll mm -hmm. always take the few close friends over the acquaintances. The other thing is, so we have this kind of loneliness act epidemic, right? Mm -hmm. I think that it's important to be self-aware about who you are because there are some people that might be more comfortable with having a large group of friends. There mm -hmm. might be some people that are more comfortable kind of being more introverted. Mm -hmm. um, something that I've been more focused on is like, like tr looking at Myers-Briggs and trying to find out what my personality type is mm -hmm. and then kind of working back from there. Um, if anyone goes on 16personalities.com, check that out. That will freak you out of like how accurate it is, how accurate it is. Um, but at the end of the day though, we, we need this human connection outside of our phones and we have to have a healthy relationship with our phones. Um, I also think that we have to remove the stigma of like mental illness as well mm -hmm. in our society. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, you talk about 
first getting to New York and being lonely. And, and, and I felt that too. It's weird, right? You're, you're in a subway car with like hundreds of people and you're walking around the city and you're like, why do I feel alone? Um, I think for some people it's like, if you move to New York and you're from Phoenix, like you should be talking to your parents a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Talking to your friends back home. Um, if you need to go see a therapist, go, go do that. I think it's so important to remove the stigma of like, you are in this alone. Um, it's okay to ask for help as well. 100%. Um, you know, 46% of people in the United States as a whole feel loneliness regularly. Right. So, you know, you've 330 million people in this country and roughly speaking, 150 million are going to feel lonely regularly yet it's such this it's like a touchy taboo topic yeah, right. because nobody wants to say hey i'm lonely it almost a lot of the times it can come off petty like oh okay you're just looking for attention or right. you know it can come off just kind of awkward like oh, okay you're lonely like i get it you know whatever or you know and that can leave the person embarrassed so to say that is it's just very uncomfortable but it's also because of the stigma that's around it like you're saying you know um loneliness can then you know kind of develop into depression and then when you're depressed like nobody wants to say hey i'm depressed <laughs> right, right right so um if you kind of eliminate that stigma and the taboo aspect of it i think that you'd be in a much better place from a societal standpoint because then all of a sudden it's like cool it's okay to say hey i'm lonely do you want to get coffee um right. you know maybe that's probably not the way that you would phrase it <laughs> yeah but just um <laughs> yeah but uh you know, I, I would highly encourage anybody that's feel you know in a slump and feeling that way to like reach out to a coworker. Just say, hey, can we grab lunch? Or you know, and it depends on the you know culture at your company. If everybody's kind of very heads down and it's very strict and suit and tie and whatever the case is, then you know try. There's apps as well, right? You know, you have things like Bumble and Tinder yeah. and whatever, and they have friend sections if that's what you're looking for. Whatever the case is, like there are certainly ways to go around it. Um, but at the same time, you know, to speak to what you were saying. It also depends on who you are. Like some things are very uncomfortable for people where, you know, there, I have friends that would hate to go to a party with more than 10 people. Right. <laughs> that would just, you know, it would give them crazy anxiety. They wouldn't know who to talk to or what to talk about. And that's just not who they are. Yeah. To the contrary, like, you know, reading a book with a friend or, you know, going and seeing a movie with two other people, that's where they're comfortable and that's where they're happy. So do what makes you happiest. Listen to yourself. You know, self-awareness is a big, big aspect of that. Um, you spent a year, uh, you spent almost two years, like a year and four mm -hmm. months working at Vayner. What was the culture like there? Culture? I, it's, um, it's very friendly. So, uh, it's, it's a little complicated to be okay. honest, because I was on team Gary, uh, which is now a team of about 30 people. When I left, it was 32 when I left. Um, but then Vayner as a whole is, you know, an agency over 900 people. Um, and so team Gary almost has its own little bubble. You don't really step into the agency side of the world too frequently. You're um, focused on Gary's personal brand. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, I did do some client services for the agency, um, but nothing super significant, never super consistently. Um, 90, you know, 97 percent of your time is just like, what can we do to promote Gary's message and get more people to, you know, find out who this guy is and see if he can impact their lives in a meaningful way. Um, so being said, we were kind of isolated, but, you know, the agency as a whole is very. Uh, very friendly. Everybody talks to each other for the most part. Everybody's very welcoming. I've never had a run in with a coworker at the agency where I was like, man, he's a dick or whatever the case is. Um, everybody always tries to be really nice to each other. But, uh, you know, the only like negative aspect to it is that on like Team Gary, for example, there's, I don't know how to say it, there's like this underlying message of, you know, if you come in at nine and you leave at six, you're really not working hard enough. Okay. Um, you know, if you leave at seven, like that's okay. You know, seven thirty, like, okay, good. And then if you're leaving at like eight or nine, like, damn, he's a hard worker, right. you know? Uh, and so in turn, like it was always awkward if you tried to get up and be the first one to go at like six thirty, right? Right. Uh, because everybody on team Gary is going to stay till like eight or nine o'clock. And so a lot of the times that's just not healthy. You have a very big, you know, lack in your life of like a work life balance. Like sure. where's the social aspect? Are you going to get dinner with friends after work today? Like, is there any other time where you're focused on something other than the work because you're scared about how your coworkers are going to see you? Um, yeah. I had to slowly get out of that mindset. Uh, you know, when I first started working at uh, VaynerMedia, I would leave at anywhere between 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. Then I was getting there at like 8 a.m. Yeah. So, you know, it was long days, long almost 12-hour days. days. Yeah. But then over time, I realized like, okay, 
you know, this isn't as big of a deal as I think it is. I know for a fact, like the management on Team Gary, like Andy Cranach or David Rock um, or Sid Steer, those are great guys. And they will always say, please like leave at six and, you know, go on a walk, like do something to get out there. I right. really don't want you to feel like you're locked in here. Um, and they're really trying to do their best. So it's nothing on management or anything of that sort. It's just that because Gary promotes this like hustle mentality, you know, you have to work your face off, bleed right. your eyes out mindset. Um, the people that are attracted to that are the people that are like, cool, I'm going to come here and I'm going to eat shit, you know? And then all of a sudden they're working for, eight, nine, 10 hours on the weekend, you know, on a, like a Saturday, they'll come into the office, you know, I've done it as well. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where team Gary's great, but everybody's kind of upset, like, you know, not upset with the work environment itself because they're putting themselves in that situation, but, um, they're upset because they don't have no social life or, you know, they're not seeing anybody. I know people that literally have no friends outside of team Gary on oh, the team. team. Gary. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, it's crazy to me. Um, you know, and I don't blame them because I was in the same situation when I came to New York, but, uh, it's something that I wish that they would really try to work on just a bit more. They are doing a good job. They're really trying to push it. Um, but you know, there are, is that still like underlying message of like, Oh, you left at six. Like, man, you're leaving early. You know, there's, there's no way to not feel that when everyone else is, is doing it. I mean, and thank you so much for being transparent mm -hmm. about that. Do you think, though, that because his message is so positive and because he's so inspirational, that when you're working there, you feel like there's this other force behind you to actually put in those longer hours, mm -hmm. meaning that there's people that talk about you know, going to law school, getting out of law school, working 80 hours a week as a lawyer mm -hmm. and hating their life because they don't think they're any, doing anything meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, it's clear that you know, at least from my perspective, the content that you're working on with Gary, you're, you're doing something meaningful and putting something positive in, into the world that make it a little bit better. Um, so yes and no, uh, truth be told, like we're human, right? So, yeah. um, the, the hard part is that, uh, there were days at VaynerMedia where I felt so good about the work that I was doing. I would be like, man, you know, me putting out that piece of content or editing that video, which Gary just posted, that contributed to, you know, potentially reaching somebody. And maybe that person was on the verge of like killing themselves, like something terrible. That's now real shit. That's it's super real. real. Shit. Like, people don't understand yeah. like how often that happens. Like the amount of emails that Gary would receive that he would forward to our team of just like, people that are literally saying, Gary, you changed my life. You know, I made $10,000 a year. I hated my life. I was addicted to meth. Like, but now, you know, I decided to go to garage sales and flip stuff and I'm making 40,000, but I'm happy. And you know, that's okay. Or I meant to say a hundred thousand the first right. time, but I said 10,000. Um, you know, like that's super real and people don't understand that. So like, there's absolutely that super positive aspect to it. The only difficulty is like, when that's your day in and day out, sometimes you become numb to it, right? And then all of a sure. sudden you yeah. get to the feeling where it's just like, you kind of feel like you're checking the box. You know, it's just like, okay, another video, um, you know, another tweet or another, right. well, we don't really tweet on his behalf, but like another article or whatever the case is, where eventually you can kind of get into this cadence of just like, you're just doing it to do it or you're doing it to grow Gary, but then that feels empty. But then I would constantly kind of have to, not constantly, but I would try to remind myself of just like, hey, this is actually really important because the people that are being affected by this, right. you know, it's really benefiting their lives. Like we're seeing the emails, we're seeing people coming in person. Um, one of the best examples is this woman that went to one of Gary's pop-up shops for his shoe in California and she came up to him and she was sobbing. And so he was a little worried, you know, going into it. It's like, okay, this yeah. woman that I've never seen before yeah, is coming kind of, up sobbing. Yeah. Um, and she's just like, I'm so sorry like to bother you, but like you changed my life. I want to give this to you. And she hands him a little card and she says, that's my certificate to own a firearm. I was going to kill myself, but then I came across your content and I decided not to. And that's just like, when you see something like that, like I get chills right now yeah, just thinking about crazy. it, right? It's, it's crazy. the craziest thing in the world. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely like a positive message and there's a lot when you actually remind yourself of those things and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I'm not checking a box. I'm right. really impacting people. Right. Um, did that inform your next move and, and what you're doing now and how you're thinking about your career as like a 19 year old? <laughs> because I mean, so, so for me, right. 
Um, I've worked at a number of different startup companies mm-hmm. since graduating school. I've tried my hand at a couple of startups that weren't successful. Mm-hmm. Um, I've taken the job for the paycheck before, mm-hmm. and it's very easy in this society to do that. It's very easy when you text your group chat and you're like, yeah, I'm like making this. It's like, yeah. oh, shit. Yeah, of course. Right? Um, but I've also been in that situation where I'm going to work and I'm just like, I don't feel this. And, and I don't know if I'm just being kind of like... Uh, um, what's it called? First world problems mm-hmm. by, by just saying like, I'm, I'm not happy with this job, even mm-hmm. though I'm, I'm making good money. Um, but I think that for those people in those situations, it's so courageous. And I think it's so amazing to be able to be like, okay, you know what? I want to do something different. Yeah. You have, you're lucky to be 19 years old and have already had the experience of working mm-hmm. for Gary. Um, hopefully like it takes you in that direction now where mm-hmm. you know that when you make business decisions and career decisions, you're making it because you want to do something meaningful and you're thinking about yourself rather than like, this is the paycheck. 100%. So um, I was put into like an interesting situation right i uh i started working for gary i was essentially making thirty thousand dollars a year with no overtime yeah um so it really wasn't much but at the same time i didn't mind because i knew why i was there and you know i had a very clear vision of what i was trying to get and you know what i was trying to achieve um i ended up getting put on salary at vayner media um shortly after like nine months uh, give or take um and that was for fifty thousand seven hundred dollars and then they gave me a bump at the beginning of 2019 for fifty eight thousand and 500 so all in all for new york city standards that was quite low um, no, across yeah. the board you know yeah. even on salary that was not necessarily like a very luxurious place to be yeah. um but you know you could live and i i could still to this day if i were still making thirty thousand, like i could live very comfortably and i can say that just because you can find an apartment that's 800 a month and then you can sure. have your extra a thousand after tax to get your groceries and go see a friend for dinner sometime you know it's it's definitely doable, but people look at the number and they're just like, oh my God, you were yeah. so underpaid or whatever the case is. And I'm sure a lot of people said that. Oh, of yeah. course. You because know? there's people that are working in, in social media marketing at agencies or other places that are making 75, 80K. 100%. Um, yeah. and, and to me, it was it was never really about the money because I, I wasn't going into it for that reason. So it didn't matter from the start. And so now it's, it's an interesting position because um, having left Vayner, you know, it's been a little over a month now. Um, I've actually, I'm on track to making significantly more than I was, uh, while at Vayner, but simultaneously I have like more time to kind of spend time with friends or just, you know, uh, go to the gym or whatever the case is, which is excellent. You know, it's, it's a blessing. Um, but there's definitely like a stigma still in society, obviously, because people think that your salary is your worth as a human. Um, (laughs) and so I was very conflicted prior to that article of like whether or not I mention, um, that I was a resident because it, it, for selfish reasons, I didn't know if it would affect whether or not people were willing to pay me very well for like right, client services. Right, right. I thought maybe they're like, oh, well, you know, Gary only paid you $15 an hour. Why can't I offer you a hundred bucks to do X, Y, and Z? And I'd yeah. be like, okay. So I was, you know, there were a lot of thoughts like that that went through my head. And then simultaneously, like, it's also, it's just, it's not embarrassing, but it's, uh, it's just not comfortable, right? To mention like how much you were paid, especially sure. if it's low. Um, to the contrary, if, you know, if I made 300,000 a year at Vayner and mentioning 300,000, um, that would be much more confident because, you know, it's just like, Hey, I got compensated really well. I'm worth a lot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But people don't see that. They, they think that salary is your worth as a person when it's really not like the salary you should really just look at it is just like cool my lifestyle requires me to make you know 50,000 a year then if i can find a job where i make 55,000 but and i'm really happy then i should take that over the job that pays me 200,000 but i'd be absolutely miserable um but it's a hard hurdle to get over it's a hard hurdle and again i mean i think that we have to we have to also take into account the fact that different people have different needs in life mm-hmm. um and sometimes again i, I i'm very lucky to mm-hmm. be able to and i mean you are too to be able to actually take a lower salary like that mm-hmm. there's people out there with with sick parents that mm-hmm just need to make a good salary and it's harder for them to kind of chase their passion. But that's why I think it's so important that if you have that freedom um, to be able to do that, you should put all of your effort into chasing what makes you happy. And I mean, it's, and you can kind of just take into consideration the people that you meet that have the most contentment. 
either they're doing something that they're passionate about or they're really passionate about other aspects of their life mm-hmm. that their job allow them to kind of execute on. 100%. I mean, uh, to kind of speak to that, uh, my older brother would be a really good example. He's about to graduate university from McGill in Montreal this summer. Um, and when he was going through the job application process, uh, there were two companies, which I'll leave, I, I won't include their names sure. just for confidentiality, but um, two big companies that he was considering working at, one of which was based in Austin, Texas, that was offering him, I want to say like 85000 a year to go work there. You know, fresh out of college, that's not a bad salary, especially in Austin, that goes quite a long way. Sure. Um, and then there was another company, a uh, very large corporation based in Vancouver, uh, Canada, that said 60000 Canadian in Vancouver. Vancouver is a very expensive area, yeah. and 60000 Canadian is not a very good competitive salary but my brother actually took the 60,000 because he noticed that with this other job he would be able to travel more and he's really hoping to go to Spanish speaking countries because he's trying to become fluent in Spanish and so okay. he thought that that would be a great opportunity and then on top of that he thought that this would be a much better stepping stone than the other one would um, however I, I can only imagine that most people in the same situation would say, what, 85K versus 60,000 Canadian, which is like 50K American? That's a big difference. You know, it's That's like, yeah, it's $35,000. And let alone one area that he was that he's going to live in now is vastly more expensive than the other. Um, but he still just decided to take the lower paying job in the more expensive area because he thought it'd be a better stepping stone and he thought he'd be happier. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just, it's not something you see very frequently because people like money is what gets so many people interested. Sure. Right. Uh, Ryan Serhant is a client of mine. He's a real estate agent here in New York city. And if we post a YouTube video on his channel and I, I, to be very clear, I don't necessarily have a whole lot to do with his YouTube posting. Um, but if he posts a video on his YouTube channel that says touring a, you know, $188 million mansion in Beverly Hills, I've seen those videos. Yeah. That video is going to get exponentially more views than the one that says $4 million apartment in Brooklyn, because sure. the price tag alone is just like, you know, that's what people care about. You yeah. know, the 188 million, that's huge. That's awesome. 4 million. Like that's still a lot of money, but people care a lot less. Right. So money is just the thing that people have learned that that's worth, right? You know, and so we pay a lot more attention to it than we probably should. Um, one of the things Gary, one of the things Gary said in my podcast was he's the he's a dichotomy between Richard Pryor, his delivery style, okay. talking about Buddha shit. Okay, and I've had conversations with, for example, like people that are really into yoga, mm-hmm. um, and people that are really into yoga specifically from India might be a little bit more aggressive to the Instagram yogi girl that sure. might be showing in herself in a bikini or whatever. The way that I think about it is whatever is the gateway drug to get you into understanding something deeper, it's okay with me. Meaning that if that if that money if that money video gets you motivated to be passionate and work hard and be Mm -hmm. hungry and be ambitious Mm -hmm. um, and be positive, then that's a good thing. I think that's something that, you know, I might, I might have a boring delivery style if I'm in a very like meditative, like chill space. Mm -hmm. Um, If it doesn't get the message across and if if it doesn't influence people to make those decisions that you want, Mm -hmm. then it's not going to work. 100%. So to clarify, I'm by no means saying that money is bad. Sure. In and of itself, money's awesome, right? Like I would love to have another million dollars in the bank. Not, I don't have a million in the bank account. So I shouldn't <laughs> have said another, but I would love to have a million, a million in the bank yeah, account. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, because money is more or less freedom as I see it. But I think that those lines have been blurred as of late, right? Now people, again, they see money as like overarching worth versus just like, how can I actually use this? I, I think that, people value how much money you have in the bank much more than they do the actual like lifestyle that you live, right? If you have a wife and three kids and you only make 75,000, but you're super happy. Meanwhile, somebody else has, you know, they're divorced and you know, they've, they don't get to see their kids very frequently and they're just miserable, but they make 300 K and people are like, man, he lives the life. He has a really nice apartment and a really nice car. But on the back end, like you have no idea what's going on in his head. Right. And, you know, if that's the circumstances, I guarantee he's probably not as happy as the guy that's making 75 with his wife and kids at home. And so, you know, 
This um, is how it kind of works. One of the one of the things that I like to do, and this is this is kind of geeky, but um, sometimes on Saturdays I, I live in Jersey and mm-hmm. I'll go get my like morning coffee, drive to like Starbucks or mm-hmm. something, and then I take a longer drive back and I drive through little neighborhoods mm-hmm. in my town, and I always have these thoughts of like the like I think about the people living in the neighborhoods, and sometimes you'll drive by these very expensive houses, and you think and the you know you might think to yourself, oh these people might must be so happy to be living like this, and mm-hmm. like I think about it different. It's like what what's really going on in your head the grass is always greener on the other side right it's much easier for me to look at 432 park or 423 park whatever the building is and just say man like it would be incredible to live there because i've absolutely said that you know just looking at that apartment has amazing views of you know central park and all these things it's so easy for me to say that anybody that lives in that building must be so happy so lucky you just come home and then you have an amazing view when in actuality like there could be a thousand things going wrong you know somebody that lives there they're father might have cancer and is going to pass away soon like that's heart-wrenching right and so meanwhile they could care less they would give up the apartment in a a snap if they could you know just you know help their dad um so you really just have no idea but it's so easy to look at materials and assume that man that must mean that this person is happy because they have these nice things because that's kind of how we've grown to see it you know um i read a really interesting book called uh the influential mind by Tally Sherritt, or uh, Sherry Tallett, Tally Sherritt, I want to say. Okay. Um, and one of the sections was about how humans perceive worth. And so at one point, the, the author mentions that she wanted to test this thing with her daughter, where uh, in certain like uh, Native American cultures, if I'm not mistaken, they would put like four items in front of a baby and whatever item the baby chose said what they would end up doing. So if they put like a fish in front of the baby uh, or, you know, a you know, knitting material in front of the baby or like a sword, uh, you know, whatever the case is, if the baby chose the sword, they'd be a warrior. If they chose the fish, they'd be a fisher. If they chose the knitting thing, they'd stay at home and they'd make clothes or whatever. Right. Right. Very self-explanatory. She tried to do this with her child. um, And because the author is a neuroscientist, uh, she did it in a much more scientific path. She put like (laughs) a brain in front of the baby, you know, like a plastic brain to see if she uh, would also be a neuroscientist or like a plastic heart to see if she would be, uh, you know, a cardiologist. Is that correct? Um, You know, and things of that sort. And then the baby sits there in front of these four items and then turns around and grabs the mother's iPhone off the table because that's what the baby saw is like most valuable. Uh, When kids are growing up, they see their parents always on their phones. And so as a result, it's just like, man, these people spend so much time with this thing, it must be of value. And that's the same thing that we perceive things now, right? So if we look at a beautiful apartment that everybody thinks is like, man, that's amazing. The only reason why we say that is because, you know, you think, man, that's super luxurious. I start thinking that as well. We have so much influence on one another sure. that we don't even realize. Group so there's think. so many amu- um, like amazing things like that. If you want to read this book, again, it's called The Influential Mind. The Influential I Mind. I want to say Tally Sherritt. I want to okay. say is her name. I, I apologize if I get that wrong but uh incredible book so that's super interesting yeah we we make decisions based on not only our inherent value but also what the external apparent value of 100 is 100 percent uh closing up now where do you where do you think we go with that one of the things that gary says is that his views are going to be a much more popular in mm-hmm. 27 years mm-hmm. I think we're at this very interesting point where we're seeing these increasing levels of anxiety and and stress and depression in younger people. We're also seeing an increased interest in meditation and Mm -hmm. yoga Mm -hmm. um, and spirituality and philosophy and truth. Um, Do you think that we go in the right direction? Do you think that kind of everything coming up now is, is we're, we're just kind of as a society, like all our shit's just like coming to the surface through social media and, and eventually we kind of work through that. In a sense, yeah. And, and I would say that we're certainly headed in the right direction. Uh, you know, as an example, when I posted my article uh, saying that I quit working for Gary, the amount of comments saying that, you know, people saying, I commend your transparency or man, it's so, you know, refreshing to see somebody be so honest when I saw that, I I really had a hard time kind of understanding. I was like, was it because I mentioned compensation? Was it because I mentioned what I'm doing? Like, you know, I really couldn't understand exactly where they were coming from. Right. But what I've learned very quickly is that 
transparency, truth, authenticity, just being yourself and understanding yourself and then projecting that into the world will always be more valuable than, you know, trying to be someone or be like something that you're not. So when we're in this place of, you know, consumerism and, you know, trying to work, 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 you know, 16 hours a day, but then we have terrible social lives and, you know, we get lonely or whatever the case is, being mindful about what your needs are and who you are and how you're going to navigate within yourself is always probably the most beneficial thing that you're going to do uh, for yourself. And obviously, if you can't figure it out, like if you have a really hard time just saying, I have no idea, you know, why I'm sad or why I'm lonely. Right. Um, it's always worth seeing, you know, seeking out professional help from a therapist or whatever the case is. But in terms of social as a whole, in terms of how we're navigating it and how Gary is saying, hey, speak your truth and everybody needs to be authentic. Obviously, you also have counter players that are going to say the opposite. They would love to show off their new Rolex or their new sure. Bentley. And they're going to say, man, I'm living the life. Um, Shout out Ty Lopez. <laughs> I was gonna say names, yeah, I said it. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, I, I absolutely agree with Gary's standpoint. It, you know, we are definitely getting to a place where we're slowly cutting out the bullshit. Um, it's it's very easy for me, at least, to see who's fake and who's not. And sometimes social makes that very difficult. Um okay. I know somebody, and again, no names being named, but I know somebody that uh, would always post on Instagram talking about how hard they work and, you know, how they're hustling and they're finally achieving their goals and all these great things. Sure. Um, when I met this person in person, I found out that one of my very close friends had been trying to give them as many clients as possible, but they were just like, no, I don't need it because they were trying to, you know, put on this facade of like, oh, you know, I'm already really well off. And then they couldn't pay their rent and they became homeless and lived in front of a Starbucks. Jesus. And I was, I was like baffling that you care so much about this image yeah. of just like, you know, you, you know, putting out, I work really hard and I'm going to be successful or I am successful or whatever the case is that you're actually going to completely deny your well being to the point where you're willing to go homeless just to keep up the facade. But then people find out, people right? find you, out. You, your shit gets found out. You will absolutely, yeah. you know, people are in a cut the shit mentality now. And so you will absolutely just get, you know, weeded out so quickly now with social yeah. just because everything's coming to light. You know, as you were saying, everything's getting flushed to the surface and then we're going to figure out how to navigate. And I think for those people, I mean, I'm, I'm extremely, I feel compassion towards them um, mm -hmm. because they're obviously in a place where they need help and they're not of course. ready to ad of course. admit it yet. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, last question. Yes. Um, so uh, you could go on a road trip okay. anywhere in the world okay. um, and you get to bring one person or a group of people alive or dead. Who, do, who would you go on a road trip with and, and where would you go? If I bring dead people, they're not dead, right? They're not. I mean, like, <laughs> I'm yeah. Joking. I'm joking. <laughs> um, man, okay. That's, that's a really tough question. Um, I've had a fascination with Nepal for some reason. Okay. Um, it it kind of stems from a few places. Uh, Me too, dude. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, awesome. yeah. If, if I'm going to be very honest, the way that I first kind of got into it was through a video game. Uh, Far Cry 3, I believe, was okay. based in Nepal. Um, like Kirat, it's like this made up area. Um, but I, I just like the way that they display it in the video game was gorgeous. And so I was like, man, that's really cool, you know? And so then I went online, started looking at pictures, started reading about the culture. And I found out it's this beautiful country that not many people visit. Right. And then on top of that, I ended up ordering like Nepali teas because at home I drink a lot of tea. <laughs> and now like one of my favorite teas in the world is silver tip tea, which is from the mountains of Nepal and silver all these tip things. Silver tip tea, okay. You know, so. Um, I would need to check that out. I drink a shitload of shit. Yeah, shit. okay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, so I would say Nepal would be the country and then friends alive or dead um i would just have to say alive because you know i'm i'm sure I, you know what there are people like alan watts who i think is probably one of the most enlightened people to have ever lived For sure. um you know and i would love to pick his brain on a thousand different topics but uh just for the sake of feeling like i'm progressing rather than like almost dwelling on people that i can't meet um i would much rather just bring honestly just close friends like close, close friends, friends that um that i know that i would have a good time with be happy with and things of that sort um i'm sure that you know i could bring somebody that i love like uh, like i love tim ferris i love alex icon oh we could have um, went for another you know, hour <laughs> exactly some, uh, some entrepreneurs that are just incredible and they're extremely mindful of who they are and how they navigate life um 
but I, I think I would just bring the people that I actually know and that I think I would be happiest with. So, you know, like my, I love my roommates. I love, you know, I've like a core group of about four friends that I constantly hang out with here in the city. So that would be my crew. Okay. <laughs> Going to Nepal. I have to extend this actually, because okay. I just have to mention this, this point. Yeah. Um, Tim Ferriss, for anybody listening, um, four hour work week, but he is, he's so interesting to me because I've seen his, um, progression from this guy that was very interested in entrepreneurship to mm -hmm. then kind of opening up about his kind of problems dealing with depression. And mm -hmm. now he's extremely passionate about, um, talking about maps and, ta and, and talking about the, the use of different psych psych psychedelics to heal trauma and um, doing podcasts with people like Gabriel Mate. So um, if you're interested in, in some deeper conversations, definitely mm -hmm. check Tim Ferriss out. And you can actually see the progression from when he started his podcast, mm -hmm. talking about more productivity tips to kind of where he is now. It's mm -hmm. super cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, cool. Thanks, man. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah.